Nicholas, what do you like about Bodega Bay School? The activities, everything. And what would you like to do when you grow up? Every job in the world. Congratulations to Nicholas Green. that that future should be given uh, to someone else. In fact, it would have been a terrible act of, um, of deprivation, it seems to me, to have not given that future to someone else. The tragedy happened as the Greens were touring southern Italy. They were ambushed by highway robbers as Nicholas and his little sister slept in the back seat of the car. Reginald Green decided to outrun his assailants, who fired several shots. For a while, he was unaware that a bullet had struck his son in the head. Nicholas lapsed into a coma and died in a hospital two days later. He was in perfect health, and he had died. So the real Nicholas wasn't in that body anymore. The real Nicholas was, was somewhere else um, in our hearts and our memories. Um, I mean, I still think of Nicholas a hundred times a day in his funny little ways. but. Um, uh, that body wasn't the essential Nicholas anymore. So we weren't doing anything to harm him, and we were doing something that could help others. He, before he had looked like a sleeping child, and now it was clear that the, that the machines were breathing for him and forcing air into his lungs and keeping his heart going. And so it, I hated the thought of him being keep, kept alive on those machines after he was dead. We brought Nicholas's body home and we buried him in, in the cemetery here. We didn't give up anything there. We could have had an open casket. You know, we could still do that. When kids talked to him, he always listened, and he never ignored them. He almost always had a smile on his face. He always played with kids when no one else would. He was never mean to anybody. Little Nicholas Green from Bodega Bay School was an angel and obviously a very effective one since he got his job done in only seven short years. And obviously a, bit, a very powerful one since his teaching has been felt by not only me, his family, the students, the staff, the community, but entire countries. We had a, a lady wrote to us who said that she lost her um, four-year-old daughter and imagines that she's playing with Nicholas now in a, in a place where there's no violence. A lot of them say things like, um, this story has um, given me hope for a gentler world, or they've, um, <laughs> I can't uh, uh, th think about them without tears coming to my eyes. Um, they give their children an extra hug uh, before they go off to school in the morning because uh, they've realized how precious life is. When I went into the, the hospital on the, that last day after we'd made the decision and he was lying on a, on a stretcher and the first thing I saw when I walked in the room was his freckles. And I thought to myself, I wish they could have used those. <laughs> I do feel close to them in a way. You know, it's, it's not, they're not Nicholas's organs anymore, they're theirs, but I, I do feel close to them because we've been able to help them. There were seven uh, recipients. Um, that surprised us because, you know, we never, we never thought of that. We're amateurs <laughs> in this business, thank goodness. But um, uh, one of them was within two days of death. There was a little boy of 15 years old who was only the same size as Nicholas at seven. 
there was a girl who had been in a deep coma, repeatedly in, in comas. And then there was a man who uh, got the, uh, one of the corneas and had been going blind at one time, and now could see his children. Wrote us a very moving letter on that uh, subject. So these people were very sick. And uh, of course, for us to know who they were does add an extra dimension because we've seen the joy in their families' faces and in their own now that having come back from the shadow of death. And uh, that, of course, is very soothing to us. In this country, usually it's anonymous. Um, usually uh, the recipient don't know, doesn't know who the donor is, and usually the donor family doesn't know who the recipients are. Um, and they, have, they can have anonymous communication. That may change, I don't know. It helped that we were both together to make that decision. It would have been much more difficult if just I or just Maggie, I think, had been there alone. When it comes time to make that decision, there could be many family members there who've, who've gathered together to comfort each other. Um, but there may be one who would say, I, I don't think that's what he would have wanted. Um, maybe there'll be one person who doesn't agree that, that, um, that donating the organs is the right thing to do. And it, it can make it much more difficult if they don't know that that's, um, that's what the person would have wanted. Uh, and in a time like that, it's even one, one voice can, can make everybody doubt, and, and it's much more difficult. I think Reg and I were, were lucky that we, we did really agree right from the beginning. It, it, um, it was clear to us that that was the right choice. The procedure was very simple. It uh, appeared to us that they had a protocol all laid out, and all it demanded was that we would um, sign forms that we had made this decision. When we did agree, um, then they had a, a protocol that they went through and a regular testing to be sure that there was no mistake and calling in the specialists and, and making the arrangements. Um, we really had a sense that they were very careful, they wouldn't make a mistake and that they'd done this many times and knew just what to do. It's been a great surprise to Maggie and me to know that signing the donor card is not enough. And I've mentioned this to a number of people now who are equally surprised. We have all thought that once the donor card was signed, that was really automatic from then on. It turns out not to be the case. If your family doesn't know that you signed it, in any case, they'll be asked um, in the hospital. They'll go and, and the doctors will, will ask them. And it'll, it makes such a big difference to them to know that, that you signed the card and that that's what you think is the right thing to do they can feel as if they're um, carrying out your wishes. And, um, and it, it does happen that people sign their donor card and nobody knows, and, and it makes it much harder for the family to agree. One thing about it is that you really only need to do it once. It's not something you have to keep bringing up. It's, um, you know, once you've made that decision, if, if you tell your closest relatives, um, and it can be a simple discussion and saying that that's what you've done, um, and then they know. Um, and maybe, who knows, maybe they'll decide to, to sign their donor card too and, and it can, can lead to more, but um, it's, it's a simple thing to do. There are seven or eight people uh, a day who die in this country um, for the failure of, uh, of one organ. What a terrible waste uh, that all seems. There's a waiting list of close to 40,000 people waiting for transplants at any one time. So that um, although uh, we've seen this in, in Italy as being a serious problem, uh, it's a worldwide problem. And it's a problem that can be cured, of course. We thought he was a very special boy. He was a very bright boy, but he was also a very good boy. And I know that this is the decision he would have wanted us to make. So the fact that um, it is being known by his name seems very appropriate to me. It, it would have been what he would have done if he'd had the chance.